you know, it's going to be on YouTube and stuff, but we're not doing it to show your faces, we're doing it to show the program. Uh, and tonight, our program is the 200 Years of Shaker History, and Becky is here tonight to do the program. I don't know really anything about it, so you should all be glad that I'm not doing it. <laughs> My name is Kaylee. I probably know everybody here. I've seen you at least once or twice. I am the assistant librarian here at the library, and we are very happy that you all joined out tonight in the pitch black to join us for this. Um, I'll mention one other program that's coming up. We are doing a New Hampshire Humanities program, the Vietnam War um, Diverse Perspectives, and that is Tuesday, November 27th, 6.30 to 7.30, and we'll be showing clips from Vietnam War by Ken Burns and holding a discussion as well with Dr. Mark Gilbertson. So we'd love to see you there for that one as well. But I will let Becky do all of the talking about this, and thank you. And thank you, Becky. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So you're a really nice small crowd tonight, so please don't be shy. I have, I don't know, somewhere between 45 minutes to an hour worth of content, depending on how much I get distracted <coughs> I say. But please don't be shy jumping in and asking questions if something interesting comes up. I'd much rather that we have an evening presentation that's engaging and useful and educational for all of you, rather than me just doing what I have prepared. So as Kaylee said, I work at Canterbury Shaker Village, where I'm the um, daily visitor and youth programs manager. And one of my favorite parts of my job is that sometimes they let me out of my office and I get to come places like the Guilford Public Library and talk to all of you. So just so I can gauge my audience a little bit, how many of you have been to Canterbury Shaker Village before? Oh, so it turns out, I guess I don't need to give a presentation. <laughs> I can go home early tonight. No, but I really hope that um, if you've visited us recently, that's great. And if you have visited us a long time ago, please do think about coming coming back again. Before I forget, I got to do our public service announcement that our next uh, major event in the village is Christmas at Canterbury. So we have a number of Christmas programs in early December. So ask me more about that or check our website for more information. But today I want to sort of a refresher course perhaps for some of you and maybe new information for others. I want to sort of go over the 200 years that Canterbury was an active Shaker community. So from 1792 until 1992, there were Shakers living and worshiping just not far down the road from us here. And the Shakers today are often called the most successful utopian experiment in America. And being on our doorstep in New Hampshire, it's well worth taking the time to learn about them. So Canterbury, looking mm. nice and wintry here, is one of 19 original Shaker communities, and it's dedicated to preserving its 200-year legacy of entrepreneurship, innovative design, and simple living. And we provide a place for learning, reflection, and renewal of the human spirit. So we're designated a National Historic Landmark because of our important historic standing. And we include um, 25 historic Shaker buildings, four reconstructed buildings, and about 697 acres of land out of the Shaker's original 3,000 acres. Mm -hmm. And virtually all of that is preserved under permanent conservation easement, which we're very fortunate to have. So before we really get delve into Canterbury and what went on there, I want to sort of step back and let's talk very briefly about the founding of Shakerism, which begins in 18th century Manchester, England. So Shakerism was founded in Manchester, England, and we often call the founder of Shakerism, we refer to a woman named Anne Lee. So she's not the, first, she's not the real founder, but she's the one who brings Shakerism to America. And Manchester, England in the mid 1750s is sort of this place of a fusion of lots of different religious influences. We have Quake, the New Quakers, and we have um, a group of French Camisards, and we have a lot of people who are very disaffected with the Church of England. And they're looking for other religions outside of this status quo. And a group of these people come together and they form what they call the Wardley Society, named after the two leaders, Jane and James Wardley. And this group really attracts the attention of their neighbors because they're not going to people's homes and worshiping God quietly. No, they're stomping out sin and they're shaking out evil and they're kind of causing a ruckus. And they're not at all afraid to march into an established church and disrupt worship. And by about the 1770, this group has attracted the attention of a young woman, Anne Lee, who was the illiterate daughter of a blacksmith, but she really comes to be a charismatic leader of this small group. And she has visions, 
And one of these visions, she interprets to mean that she should take this small group of Shakers and go to America. So in 1775, Anne Lee and eight of her followers get on board a leaky little ship called the Mariah and sail for America, which at that time is still, of course, part of its British North America. And they arrive in New York City in August of 1775. Maybe not the best time to come to America. The American Revolution is just about to sort of bubble over into active conflict, and a group of very English and very different people who worship and practice different religions is maybe not going to endear themselves to their neighbors in New York City. So this early Shaker church sort of splinters for a little while, and eventually they come back together and acquire land in a little town um, colony in New York, which in a place that they call Waterville. Now today, if any of you have had the pleasure of flying out of the Albany Airport, in Albany, New York, you have actually stood on Shaker property because the Albany Airport is where, part of that is where the community of Waterbelief was. So Ann Lee starts spreading the gospel in America. And by about, in about 1780, she goes on a missionary trip through New England. And that's in about 1782 is when a group of Free Will Baptists and other people in the Concord and Canterbury area hear about Ann Lee and the Shakers and they decide that this looks like the right religion to them. So a man named Benjamin Witcher offers his property and we get the beginnings of Canterbury. But now Mother Anne, as you can see, she dies in 1784. And we have a picture of her gravestone because um, she dies before the era of photography and there's no real accurate likeness that was painted during her life. So we only have her gravestone in Waterbury to, to recognize her. So she dies in 18, excuse me, 1784 at the age of only 48 and Shaker sort of oral tradition and narrative often says that she dies at such a young age because of all the persecutions she suffered. There are many accounts of her being sort of thrown out of a town or dragged through the streets of towns when she was preaching her gospel and um, tracking converts. So when she dies, Shakerism is still this very new religion and it hasn't yet been codified into these set communities, what's going to grow to be 19 communities. And it's going to fall to her successors to do that. And under her successors, they start articulating what today we see as sort of the basic principles of Shakerism. Now as an act of religion, Shakerism continues to grow and evolve with its membership, but these are principles, I'll put them up in a minute, these are principles that all Shakers, pretty much whether in 1780 or today at the last community in Sabbath Day Lake Maine, they would pretty much agree that these are all key tenets of Shakerism. <coughs> So Shakerism, Shakers believe in God, the omnipotent and omnipresent creator of the universe, a being that is pure spirit, and they believe that God has both male and female attributes, often referred to as God the Father and Holy Mother Wisdom, two parts of one spirit. And they assert, the Shakers assert that Anne Lee is, not, is, is the second coming of Christ, so that she was endowed with the Christ spirit just as Jesus of Nazareth was, and that she came to spread the gospel and represents the second coming. So Shakers practice the confession of sin, so they believe that you should confess your sins before God in the presence of a witness. Perhaps what they're most well known for, they believe in living a celibate Christ-like life as brothers and sisters. So you'll hear the adult members of a community referred to as brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so. The Shakers are communal, so they share all their goods equally, and they share their resources for the benefits of all. Now, if you were a school group, there would be a hand that had shot up right about now that says, what about their clothes? Now, of course, the Shakers do have some individual property. Your clothes belong to you. And, but for the most part, people wouldn't have private personal possessions. And Shakers are pacifists, particularly timely now, as we're getting ready to on Sunday, celebrate the 100 years from the Declaration of Armistice at the end of World War I. So the Shakers did not, Shaker brothers would not have served in the military, although they did believe in providing um, whatever civilian care that they could. So for instance, during World War I, the Shaker sisters at Canada formed a Red Cross auxiliary and um, knit for troops and sent layettes to Belgian refugees and other things that they could do to alleviate suffering in the world. So, 
always like to stop now and think about these key beliefs of Shakerism. Because when we think of Shakers, we often first think about some of the things I set up at the back of the room tonight. We think about beautiful Shaker chairs. We think about Shaker oval boxes. We think about the material items of Shaker life. But a Shaker would say, those material things are an expression of our belief. It's these that are guiding a Shaker life, not the other way around. So think less about shaker chairs and more about religious beliefs. So here we have what are the sort of 19 major shaker communities that starting um, after Anne Lee dies, they really start to be founded by her successor, a man named Joseph Meacham. So he puts communal, the, sh the idea is that the shakers are going to be communal. He puts them into actual practice. And Shakerism spreads pretty dramatically across the US very quickly. So first we get the communities sort of all clustered in New, New England and New York. And then in about 1800, the Shakers send missionaries west to Ohio and Kentucky. Now those missionaries actually walk to Kentucky, about 1,000 miles. So they are clearly dedicated to spreading their religion. And the, found, the sort of lead community of um, Shakerism is in a community called Mount Lebanon, New York, and it's another Shaker museum. Many, we're very fortunate that many Shaker villages have, have been preserved as museums, all independently owned and operated. But if you're ever out in um, New York, <coughs> just across the Massachusetts border, you can um, visit Mount Lebanon. <coughs> so all of these Shaker communities pop up where there are sort of a geographic location where there's enough converts to make it worthwhile to form a community. And at Canterbury, it happens because there's a man named Suzanne. Which one, Becky, is the one in Cleveland, Shaker Heights? It's got a yeah, different so name up there. Which my pointer's not working today. So um, so we have um, North Union, Ohio, is where that's Cleveland is. Okay, and the then one. down sort of in the Cincinnati area, we have a couple other North Union, Ohio. Ohio so yeah. OK, thank you. So at Canterbury, there's a man named Benjamin Witcher, who becomes interested in Shakers in about 17, early 1780s. And he agrees, or decides, that he's going to give his property to the church. And this is sort of where most, where most communities found. So his 100 acres really forms the nucleus of what today is Canterbury Shaker Village. Now it grew as more converts joined and their land got um, added into the church's property. And ultimately, they end up with about 3,000 acres. And it starts slow, but we know, due to census records, that by about 1790, there's about 35 people living together on Benjamin Witcher's property. Now, the census taker doesn't understand what a Shaker community is, so he says it's 35 members of the Witcher family. But we know they are, are, new, they are new Shaker converts. And we don't have much that dates to this era. So the only building at Canterbury that dates to this very early era is a building that we call the Syrup Shop today. And probably the middle portion of the building was once an outbuilding on the Witcher farm. But it's a big process to convert what was once a family farm for Benjamin Witcher and his family into a Shaker community that's going to grow to have over 100 members. So the Shakers start building. And the first building they're going to build is in 1792. They construct a meeting house for them to worship in. So it's the most important priority. They're a religious group. You can't do anything else unless you have a house of worship. And it's designed and built by a, by a Shaker brother named Moses Johnson, who will eventually go on to build 10 very similar meeting houses. So if you've been to other New England Shaker villages, you may very well have seen a building that looks awfully close to this. But they don't. Oh, I have more slides. So here's the interior of the meeting house today, sort of very open floor plan. We didn't talk much. I, I mentioned very briefly how the Shakers were stomping out evil and whirling and dancing. And this is going to really get codified, and we'll talk about it a bit later. But you can see that there's no um, support beams in the middle of the floor. So it's a very open span building. It's also a very sturdy pine floor. I've had a group of 30 fourth graders jumping up and down. And the floor is on granite pillars, and it's double laid pine, and it does not move, even 200 years later. And here's just a look down from, from a staircase on the second floor. So the meeting house really sets off a flurry of construction. And the Shakers get busy building, and they build many, many buildings over the next decade. And so by about the 1820s, 
they've turned from a little, little fledgling Shaker community into this very solid community. And it kind of seems to wear everyone out a little bit. And this is a part of Brother Francis Winkley's diary. And it's, his handwriting's not the best, so I will read you what, what, one of these, one of, what it says near the bottom. He says, this year past, we have been tearing down and building almost the whole time. We have built the farmers, doctors, shoemakers, wheelers, and the John Wadley shop with a cellar over it, a costly and extraordinary building indeed. We have also built a dam to, flow, to flood the lake meadow, and we made a brickyard in said meadow and a clay. We have also moved the shed at the horse barn and built 20 feet on it. We built a large wood shelter at the wood mill and built a fireplace and a chimney. We have also split and got out an abundance of stone for another building and we are almost tired. <laughs> I would be quite tired too if I'd done all that. So just to put this sort of into a, up, on the, up on the screen and get a sense of this, here are some of those many projects that Benjamin Witcher is, men or excuse me, Francis Winkley is mentioning. So I would be almost tired if I built all those. And we can really see how as soon as they built the meeting house, they start building shops because as a communal society, the Shakers want to be self-sufficient and independent. So not only do we need our meeting house and a dwelling house to live in, but we need every kind of shop that we would need for doing our work, whether that be a tannery for tanning leather or a blacksmith's shop for, for making our metalwork, um, outbuildings for our animals, all of that is necessary. And we're very lucky that we've retained a couple buildings that date from this very early era of Shaker history. So the second building the Shakers build after their meeting house is the dwelling house. As it looks today, it would have originally been much smaller. And it's the only 18th century Shaker dwelling house standing in any Shaker communities, which gives us a unique look at the way the Shakers, in this case, just kept adding on. So if you go inside the building, you'll notice that the floors don't match, and the doors are different sizes, and the windows are different sizes. And it's a very odd building but that's because the Shakers let it grow organically with the community. So it's a wonderful treasure that we have. There's also a very funny story. So the Shakers don't always get along with other communities. And you can just see that red cupola on top with a bell in it. Well, originally, in the 1850s when they put it up, the bell was five feet higher. But the Shaker leadership visited Canterbury and decided that it was extravagant and too high. <laughs> So they lowered it by five feet, and that made it OK. So the building primarily served as a dormitory where the Shakers would have eaten and slept. And um, also, they had a, a winter worship space. So we have some rooms in there. So as the community's population grows rapidly, we need lots of workshops. So one of the sisters' most important industries, so the female aspect of the community, one of their important industries was creating clothing and other household items that could be sold. And um, this, this is the spin shop where they would have done lots of their textile work. And in 1796, the year after they built it, they produced over 8,000 yards of textiles, from linen tapes for garments and chairs um, to wide wo woolen flannels. So you can imagine how long it would take sisters to do 8,000 yards. And as the population expanded, they're going, they, they start moving buildings. So this building, if you visit it today, it's actually on a different location than it was when it was constructed. And it's added on to a building that later grows to become the Shaker's Laundry. So the sisters who in their earliest years are happy to do the laundry with a bucket out by the well, now have an entire building where the laundry, the doing of laundry has been mechanized and they have drying racks and large kettles and washing machines. So whenever the Shakers are able to incorporate technology, they will. So this building is another early building that sort of shows the varied history of buildings at Canterbury. We call it the carpenter shop today, but um, it's had about four different uses since it was built in 1806. Shakers were always quick to adapt and change depending on what their needs were. So when they built it, it stood somewhere closer to the meeting house, across the village from where it is now, and it was sleeping quarters for visiting Shakers. They move it, they move it once, and then use it for the sisters. They move it a second time, and use it for the medicinal herb industry. And then they move it, and then later they convert it and use it for their um, broom making industry. 
So you can imagine that the community is always sort of shifting and changing and adjusting. So for instance, the shaker broom industry, as soon as it becomes not profitable, when um, people of the world start manufacturing brooms, the shakers stop and they move on and they look for another cost-effective way of supporting their community. Do they physically move these buildings? They do in a lot of cases. So this, that yeah. building has been physically moved about three times. Wouldn't it easier to just move them all? <laughs> you might think, <coughs> but the shakers are always thinking about it was actually relatively easy to move a building. You just you use cribbing and you raise it up and you put it on sort of rollers and you use your oxen to move it across the building, move it across the village, and then you put a new foundation underneath. So because of the way buildings were built back then, it was definitely easier to move them than it would be to move buildings today. So here is some of the inside of that, of that building today showing um, it's set up to, to show the brick making industry. So Canterbury grows fast. By the 1840s, it looks, it's more built up than it would be if you visited today and saw our 25 historic buildings. So by the 1840s, there are actually three separate Shaker families at Canterbury, and each of which has a population of maybe about 100 people. There's over 100 buildings total, and the Shakers own over 3,000 acres of land. In addition to all the sort of permanent Shakers who convert and spend a good chunk of their lives at the village, the Shakers also take in a number of short-term, sometimes called winter shakers, or sometimes called bread and butter shakers, people who are interested in the financial, perhaps, gains of joining the community, but don't maybe commit to the life religiously. And heard them called cold weather Christians. Yep, exactly, same idea. Yeah, and the Shakers were always very welcoming. They would take you in, even if they maybe were pretty sure you were going to leave in the spring. So this is a map that was drawn by one of sort of the leading lights of Canterbury, uh, a brother named Henry Blinn, who pops up again and again if you visit us. So he draws this map in 1848, and it's actually, it's a little smaller than it's projected, but it, it's quite large. And it shows the three Shaker families. Um, you can also see along the top, part of the Shaker's mill pond system. So they dig about two miles of ditches and about nine mill ponds that allow them to put up mills and really industrialize the village, which would have to be a, a whole separate topic for another evening, I think. Are there any still there, the mills? No, we, we have um, several of the mill ponds are still there and the yeah. foundations, but there aren't any mills. Yeah. The Shakers had a bad habit, or a good habit, of they didn't want sort of mess. So when a building became no longer used or if it got an unsightly, they would take it down. So the Shakers actually <coughs> took down their last mill buildings when they stopped using them. So this is a blow up of the blue map, and it shows, if you've been to Canterbury, it shows sort of what is preserved today as the central core of the museum. And most of those buildings are still standing. So I'm gonna sort of breeze on through this because I don't think any of us really care that much about the way Shaker leadership is organized. Suffice it to say that it's very complex and the Shakers are not a democracy. So there is a hierarchical structure with um, everyone reporting back to a, what they call the ministry in Mount Lebanon, New York, and then there's leaders within each community, and then um, each of those Shaker families, those sort of large units of about 75 to 100 people, they each have a system of leadership with um, roles divided up between religious life and sort of day-to-day -day work and then interaction with outside non-Shakers. So they always, they, they grew by taking in children, right? Exactly, and we'll talk a little bit more about children later, but um, no one is born a shaker, you have to convert. So in the early years, most of the conversion is adult families that convert, and mom, dad, and six kids all join the shakers. In later years, a lot of, the, a lot of um, young children are sent to the shakers and become wards of the shakers, and they always are given the option to choose to stay when they become adults. So, there's a lot of sayings about work and worship and Anne Lee, the founder of Shakerism. So as we sort of transition to talking a little bit more about those beautiful products that the Shakers made, things like oval boxes and chairs, um, that we hear some things from Anne Lee in her own words. So these are both, these are both sayings that we hear a lot, that, that you should always be paying sort of attention to your work and 
doesn't matter if you're going to die tomorrow or in a thousand years, but do it as though you had that time. And a fairly standard one, be diligent with your hands, for godliness does not lead to idleness. So the Canterbury Shakers are very diligent with their hands, and I couldn't quite get from A to Z, but I got from agricultural to weaving when I was thinking about the alphabet. So um, they're pretty busy, and the labor is divided by gender. So brothers have their own industries, and sisters have their own industries. And they'll rotate through so no one brother or sister ever gets stuck doing the same chore again and again. If you're that sister who always burns the bread in the bakery, don't worry. In four weeks, you'll get to do another task. So the Shakers want to create this independent, self-sufficient community. And agriculture is a key part of this. So we can see at the bottom left-hand corner of this picture, we can see what was their two-acre family garden with, with um, all laid out in rows for agriculture. But we all know in New Hampshire that the primary agricultural crop around here is generally rocks. So the Shakers do have agriculture, and they have a particularly successful dairy herd. So here's the cow barn. But they're really going to diversify. So they're very uh, astute managers, really astute ecological stewards. So they have land that's set aside for woodlots and for pasture and for farming. And they're very careful to rotate and do the best they can with the soil they have here in New Hampshire. So this is actually um, the, lar it was the largest cow barn in New Hampshire for most of the 19th century. It's about 250 feet long. Is that the one that eventually that burned? Yeah, it burned in the 1970s. Yeah. Thank you. But if you visit, you can still see the, the stone foundations, the large ramps that would have been there. So the sisters' most important industry, while well, the brothers are off doing their agriculture, the sisters are really busy with their textiles. So in the early years, it's a lot of weaving and spinning, and then it'll slowly sort of transition. But we mentioned those 8,000 yards of textiles the sisters produced in their spin shop. And this is a very early textile. Um, shakers tended to use things up and wear them out, so we don't have a lot of 19th century textiles. This was saved because it was converted into a little handbag that was used in the 20th century. So it preserved a bit of 19th century textiles. And as the 19th century progresses, the sisters start um, diversifying and making some of the things that we know them for today. So this is an image of a Dorothy cloak, and I brought a reproduction if anyone wants to look at it later. But um, it's a very stylish ladies cloak that you can wear and be quite elegant if you're going out to a night at the opera or maybe a night at the Guilford Public Library. <laughs> <laughs> so these are, these are sold to, the Shakers really market a lot of these um, what we call fancy work or commercial industries to a very um, upper class audience. Now that coat is red. It did, is. Did they, did they wear a lot of colorful clothing themselves? <coughs> Excuse me. So. Or is that just market shit, you know? Dorothy cloaks, you can, if you read the advertising, you can have them in pretty much any color you'd like. They're importing the wool broadcloth from France at this time. But the Shakers aren't like some other religious groups mm -hmm. that really eschew colors. So um, you might have noticed in one of the early pictures of the village, one of the color photos, there's lots of different colors in the building. So buildings were painted bright colors, and interior rooms were painted. And the sisters and brothers are going to wear colored clothing. Now, before 1860, it's all limited by what you can dye with natural plants and, and things like that. But after that, you're going to get a lot brighter colors when, when aniline um, commercial dyes come in. So I don't think you would have been likely to see a sister wearing a red Dorothy cloak. They were generally more likely, their cloaks were more gray or darker colors. So it's actually named after um, a, a well-beloved eldress at Canterbury, a woman named Dorothy Durgan, and she's going to pop up a little bit later. She's an eldress who really inspires a whole generation of young Shaker sisters who remain in the community because of her. And you can see well, across the top of that label, it says Registered U.S. Patent Office. So the Shakers are very astute. Um, they don't often patent something, but they actually trademark this, so only Canterbury cloaks can be called the Dorothy. And that's one of their way of protecting their rights and making sure that it remains a profitable industry. <coughs> now, if any of you ladies want to run right out and buy one of these, you can buy a doll's cloak in about, this is about 1900. You can buy a doll's cloak for $1.30. Or if you want a fully silk-lined ladies' cloak, it will run you $58. So that's about $750 today. So save your pennies. <laughs> 
So the sisters also, um, here's, here's a little doll wearing a Dorothy cloak. So the sisters make and sell dress shaker dolls, um, very popular sale item. And particularly nice, sometimes we get donations that come back to the village, and it's, sometimes it's lovely when we get a doll that has been taken off, was purchased at the, at the, store, at the village, went off into the world with a little girl, and now it's been returned to us, and we know who, who played it and who loved it, and now it's come back to Canterbury, which is always a nice story. Now the Shaker sisters actually keep dressing dolls into the 20th century. So in the 1950s and 60s, they're drawn, buying um, plastic dolls, like um, the walking dolls that you could get that would walk with you. So um, they keep up with the times that way. But they make other things that are all textile related. So these are part of their popular wear industry. So they're little boxes to put your knickknacks or your jewelry or your handkerchiefs in. And they're actually made out of wood from the poplar tree. It's, um, trees, a, ch a chunk of wood is cut down, the wood is split really, really fine and passed through a variety of uh, machines to get it to the right thickness and width. And then it's woven on a loom just as though you were weaving cloth. And this is one of the sisters' most lucrative items. Here they are weaving poplar wear. And it's an industry that's really only possible because the Shakers have this large group of women who are able to work together and do this. If you had to pay the sisters to weave poplar wear, it would not have been a profitable industry. Mm. So brethren's industries evolve similar to the sisters, that they're going to sort of change with the times and look for things that are profitable and successful. But a lot of their time is literally devoted to building the village. So they're constructing all, of, all the buildings in the village. These are some built-ins in the attic of the dwelling house. Um, and they also do things like make beautiful oval boxes, capitalizing on their woodworking skills. And as the community grows, there are going to be more brothers, so there's more time for different industries. And we often think of shaker oval boxes as being quintessentially shaker, but I want you to all get rid of that image, put that out of your head. At Canterbury, think shaker pails. Pails are actually a much bigger industry at, at Canterbury and they make um, pails in all sizes from little itty bitty decorative pails to big giant pails to put your water or whatever else you wanted to put in them. And the Canterbury Brethren are also making things like spinning wheels. So there was a very profitable industry making and selling spinning wheels to people of the world. Uh, and they often, spinning wheels in particular, were stamped with the initials of a community trustee, one of the business leaders, and that was sort of an early guarantee of quality. You knew if you were buying something from a Shaker village, it had the backing of the community behind it. If it was defective or didn't work in any way, you could bring it back very early, sort of money back guarantee. Where would you look for the stamp? Um, it's on the end. So I don't know, it might vary from spinning wheels being a little bit down here or up at it, generally. I should check yeah. out. So Suzanne has one, so she'll, she'll, be, she'll have to bring it sometime and show everyone. So the Shaker Brothers, we mentioned they were also busy doing agriculture. And they also sell um, medicinal herbs and make medicinal syrups that were very popular. That's how the syrup shop, that early building we saw, how it got its name, because they were making medicinal syrups there. But the brethren are always outnumbered by the sisters, particularly after 1850. And the brothers are never, they never have quite so diverse of industries as the sisters do. So now I really want to transition because all these industries are really supporting a community that's all about the religion. So worship is the central part of Shaker life. And getting outsiders like ourselves to convert is also a part of Shaker life. So here we have um, a stereo card from the 1870s titled Sunday AM. So we have all the visitors from the world have parked their buggies outside the meeting house and are, have come to observe worship. Now the Shakers, of course, hope that all these people will convert and join their community. I think some people of the world are just coming because it's an entertaining spectacle to see on Sunday, but perhaps some con converts will come with it. And they're coming because the Shakers are dancing in their worship. And over time, it becomes evolved from that sort of ecstatic worship where every shaker is doing something different and one shaker is stomping and one shaker is twirling and someone else is rolling on the floor. And it becomes codified into a sort of a set dance. 
So here's one brother in the 19th century talking about a circular march where you form elliptical circles with brothers in one circle and sisters, and you're marching around and around and around. So here we have one, I'm not showing an elliptical circle, but here we have the sisters and brothers marching in line. And this dancing, for those of you who have two left feet, no worries. The Shakers believe everyone can dance, and they would have actually practiced it. So you wouldn't have been standing up there on Sunday not knowing what to do. You would have rehearsed it. And to help you rehearse it, there are actually special pegs in the floor of the meeting house that form different lines. So you can see there's four different pegs, a dark wood, little brass ones or copper tacks, um, a stripy colored wood peg, and then there's also a light wood peg that doesn't show up in this picture. And here we see those dance cues as they're laid out on the floor of the meeting house. So if you next time you visit Canterbury and the meeting house, look down and notice something that most people miss. So the most well-known aspect of Shaker, Shaker worship is the idea that you're going to dance during worship. But the Shakers also receive a number of spiritual gifts. They're very um, they're early believers in spiritualism and. Some of those take the form of these beautiful gift drawings. So perhaps you've seen this gift drawing. It's very often reproduced. It's a drawing, something called a gift drawing or a spirit drawing, painted at Hancock, Massachusetts by a Shaker sister. And there's only about 200 surviving gift drawings. And we don't know if that's because only a few were made or if they're the kind of item that didn't survive and to survive to the 20th century be preserved. And we only know about a couple at Canterbury that were drawn. But at Canterbury, um, people's sort of religious impulses took a different way. And the Shakers at Canterbury wrote a lot of music. So this is a song that was received by inspiration. So it wasn't composed by a brother or a sister, but they believe that they received this song from a, from a spirit, from the heavens. And I think I have music with this. <coughs> Sorry. Getting the technology to work is always the trick. <laughs> was that sister, we, we saw her name earlier, the namesake of the Dorothy Cloak. So Elders Dorothy Durgan um, writes a number of songs that she receives inspirationally, starting at about the age of 19. So here's one of her songs. Draw in the early 20th century, as there's all kinds of things going on. There's jobs for women, there's 
vote, voting rights for women. There's factory jobs for men. Living a quiet, celibate shaker life in the woods of New Hampshire seems less and less appealing. And the community is going to slowly age. So by the 1940s, we have um, middle-aged sisters worshiping together in the chapel, where music is still an, a key part of their worship, but they, they will eventually stop dancing. And they stop dancing when all the members aren't able to participate. They feel that it would be wrong to dance when they're going to leave out some elderly members. <clears throat> and although Shakerism is, is trying its hardest to evolve and change with the desires of its membership throughout its 200 years, we start to really see these changes as the number of Shaker communities really shrinks. So in the, starting in about the 1880s, a number of communities close until we're down to this cluster of the original communities in New York and, and um, New England. And at this time, and about after about 1900, the Shakers start to think hard about how they can keep members and what can they do. How can they change outwardly while still retaining the key inward principles of Shakers, the religious values. And they go in different directions for recruiting these members. And at Canterbury, they decide that they'll embrace a lot of new worldly things. So instead of just having a life of work and worship, <coughs> The Canterbury Shakers introduced lots of new leisure activities. So here we have the Dwelling House Chapel where they would have worshipped, but we've added to our chapel with a radio and a phonograph. So the Shakers um, buy phonographs, they buy radios, um, they purchase board games, and they start having a little bit more fun. They also pick up cameras. So a number of Shaker brothers and sisters acquire cameras, and we are very fortunate that they did, because today we have about 10,000 historic images, that most of which the Shakers took themselves, which gives us a great view of what life was like in the early 20th century. So the Shakers have other leisure activities. Here we have some girls, and they're out sleep skiing. They also like sledding on the hill, and they play board games, as I mentioned. Um, perhaps their favorite game, based on the number of copies that we have in our collection, was Parcheesi. So they like that. And these are all very worldly activities. Nothing that would seem shaker to Mother Ann Lee. But the whole goal is that they're going to keep the community together. So you might be sitting down for an evening and playing a game of tiddlywinks, but you're doing it with your sisters and with the brethren. And it's part of being a shaker family. Canterbury Shaker, Shakers in the 20th century also start to enjoy vacations. So they need time off from the sort of the hustle and bustle of being a Shaker and working hard on the community industries. So here they are in York, Maine, in front of the Nubble Light. Um, they went on sales trips to sell their goods to these wealthy visitors here, but they also are going for pleasure to relax by the seaside. And they acquire a summer camp on Lake Winnesquam. So just like a lot of other New Hampshireites in the early 20th century, the Shakers have a little camp where they can go to and relax. And one of the things I like best about this picture is we see that the restrictions and rules of Shaker life start to get relaxed. So here at camp, the sisters can literally put their hair down and take off their Shaker caps and bonnets. One of them is still wearing it, I guess. But and the most frequent vacationers are, I, perhaps sensibly, the same, the very same sisters who are working the hardest in the commercial industries. So this is a way for them to recharge and remain committed to Shakerism without burning out from too much work. And perhaps the most bizarre concept that the Shakers embrace in the early 20th century is this idea of what the Shakers call entertainments, and we would call them amateur theatricals. So, Theatricals really take off across the United States during the early 20th century. And at Canterbury, they embrace this idea. And they start staging plays um, for important holidays. Mostly, initially, it's mostly Christmas and Easter. And then they branch out. And nearly everyone in the community is involved. So this is a Christmas um, play. It's essentially a nativity play. But their nativity play features not just Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus. We have some. Knight, Roman-esque knights, and we have um, other interesting characters that are part of it. So this is another entertainment with um, everyone up in costume of sort of the era. And 
between about the 50 years that the Shakers were doing entertainments, they put on over 120 plays. So they were quite busy. And they actually take over an entire room, a room where the brethren had once slept. The sisters take it over to have an entire room to store their props and costumes, which gives you a sense of how much stuff they had associated with this. And it really becomes an opportunity for the sisters to really explore and with self-expression and creativity. And entertainment's become a beloved community institution that were we neighbors and friends of the Shakers in the 19 teens and 20s and 30s, we would have likely been invited to watch. So um, actually for this entertainment in 1930, over 50 visitors crammed into the chapel at Canterbury to watch the entertainment. <coughs> So these two pictures are sort of my favorite juxtaposition that really show how the Shakers at Canterbury are trying really hard to maintain the key principles of Shakerism, but become modern in the 20th century. So on the left, we have our Easter religious tableau. So we have um, Jesus in the middle, portrayed by Sister Marguerite Frost, <coughs> and some, some angels or other um, prophets or apostles or um, a a people accompanying her. And then we have their secular entertainment for Easter, which is uh, the junior orchestra dressed up as um, bunnies, <laughs> slightly <laughs> odd bunnies, <laughs> just today. Bunny <coughs> and they're sort of, the Shakers are trying really hard to figure out how they keep the secular, secular worldly interests and the Shaker interests to not sort of be in conflict. And for a, a while they manage this, and a number of these young girls dressed up in bunny masks, are going to stay on as sisters and commit to Shaker life. But despite all this evolution to, change, to meet the changing times, the Canterbury Shakers can't really forestall the writing on the wall. And the community is going to slowly decline. And by about 1920, there are two Shaker brethren, 49 sisters, and 10 girls living at the community. So it really dramatically shows how much the Brethren's population declined first. And with this aging female membership, eventually they decide to close the school and the Shakers stop accepting new children in about 1935. The last Shaker brother at Canterbury is going to die in 1939, while the last sister is going to live on until 1992. And so for the sisters who see that the community life that they have known and loved and their religious way of life is ending, this 20th century is sort of this period of mid 20th century is a time of real heartbreak and loss and they have to figure out what's next. And it takes remarkable foresight for them to realize that there can be a future for Canterbury, not the future that they have lived in, but something else. So people of the world have always been fascinated by the Shakers. So this is in the 19 teens when Sister Josephine Wilson writes in her journal that 75 people have come to tour the village, been an active religious community. And the Shakers realize that maybe, maybe this is the way to go. Maybe they can preserve their community as a museum devoted to their legacy. So with the aid of some non-Shaker friends and legal help, the sisters decide to pursue this idea of preserving their home as a museum. It starts in the 1950s with our founding um, director and curator, Charles Bud Thompson. And then in 1969, the village is granted its current status as a 501c3 nonprofit. So here we have some of the last sisters of Canterbury, um, Elders Gertrude Sewell on the, in the purple and um, Elders Bertha Lindsay, who was very instrumental in the museum and very actively involved in its day-to-day -day operation. So from that time in the 1950s until the last sister dies in 1992, Canterbury is both a museum where you can come pay your admission and tour but it's also the home of these sisters who are living out their lives. And they're still living true to the Shaker principles that they grew up with. And it became one way, preserving it as a museum was really one way of ensuring that their story was told. And some of the sisters would wait on the porch, perhaps some of you have your own stories of being greeted or welcomed by the sisters who always wanted to make people feel um, welcome at Canterbury. So in 1992, exactly 200 years after the Canterbury Meeting House was constructed, the last Canterbury sister, Sister Ethel Hudson, dies at the age of 96. And she's going to be buried beside her fellow Shakers in the Shaker Cemetery. And her final request is that she leaves the village the same way that she arrived, 
when she had been a girl about 11, she arrived in a horse-drawn wagon. And her request is that she go to the cemetery in a horse-drawn hearse. So she's buried in the Shaker Cemetery, and where her grave is marked only with a single communal monument that is shared by everyone in the village, a final reminder that the Shakers are equal, even unto death. Oops, I went backwards. So that brings us up to 1992. And really from there, we've worked to preserve the system's <coughs> legacy and grow as a museum with new buildings opening and new galleries and new exhibits and new interpretation. So I hope over the last hour or so you've learned a bit more about the Shakers or learned something new, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh-oh, a real lively group tonight. <laughs> <laughs> do, they, do they give classes, art classes? I mean, all the things they used to make, I mean. Yep, so um, we have a very uh, active group of demonstrators, volunteers, who um, share and preserve a lot of Shaker trades, things like letterpress printing, um, oval box making, broom making, and then textile industries like weaving and spinning. So it depends on the different industries, but we do offer classes in a number of those. So for instance, we have really popular, they were all sold out this fall, but we offer classes in making a Shaker broom or letterpress printing, so. Did they make furniture? They did. So the Shakers make um, a lot of furniture. A lot of people point to Shaker chairs and say that the Shakers made and sold chairs. There was a, the Mount Lebanon community had a chair factory. So they made and sold chairs for the world. Canterbury made furniture primarily for its own usage. But as the community shrunk, they were always happy to sell off furniture that they didn't need to visitors. So a lot of our furniture went away in the 20th century when Shaker antiques became very popular. And some of it has slowly made its way back to us now that we're a museum. In the back? Uh, I had heard Canterbury had the first electric and they had the first cars. Can yes. you elaborate yes. on how they made the electric, so, water, oil, coal? So I don't know, the, the first is maybe relative. I did, um, Canterbury is electrified in 1910. So I know it's before the Con state, Concord State House has electricity. I don't know where else in the state would have had electricity before that. And um, they make, they generate their own power right at the village with uh, a gasoline powered electric generator mm -hmm. that's gonna charge up these large liquid cell batteries that look like fish tanks, and then that will, they can store power in those batteries and um, light their electric lights. Mm -hmm. They actually have a very clever brother who lives and works at the village in the early 20th century, and he's eventually able to hook their power generation system up to their mill system so they can use their mill turbine to generate electricity as well. Um, and their first automobile, off the top of my head, I think it's about 1906 they buy it. And um, I, was, I was just writing something for our social media post this week, and um, one of the Shakers writes about how it doesn't matter how nice or how well-maintained your automobile is, if it's last year's model, it's secondhand. <laughs> so the Shakers often buy new automobiles. Nearly every year they're going to upgrade and buy the new model. So I don't know if they had really good salesmen or if they just really felt that it was um, important for the community to have something that was new and wor worked well. Well, 1906, that's very early because that's a year before the Model T. Yeah, it's, it's in the 1905, 1906, 1907, somewhere in there. I think it was an REO speed, speed, what, what? they drove Pierce Arrows, I know that. Pardon? They drove Pierce Arrows. Oh, well, that was an expensive car. Yeah. yeah. So well, and they had expensive boats, too. And the REO, <laughs> that was Olds, who also made Olds mobile. What was Elders Bertha's last car? It's a Chrysler, isn't it? Her last car is a Pontiac Bonneville, mm -hmm. bought in 1978. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's the only Shaker car we still have. It's actually sitting in our tin garage. And money, money <laughs> permitting, at some point, we'd like to restore it. So stay tuned. Yeah. Any other questions? You, you still have a restaurant open to the public? So we have a cafe that's open when the museum's open. Oh. Um, we don't have a full year-round restaurant. We're kind of in the middle of nowhere, and it's not cost-effective. Oh. So we have a partnership with the um, Lakes, Region, Lakes Region Community College, and their culinary school often meets at the restaurant, former restaurant building. They're not there this term, but we expect they'll be back in January. Okay. So. I remember years ago, they going to a Christmas candlelight 
dinner yeah. at Canterbury. I hear that many. Was impressive. I hear lots about that. Yes. So we're not doing dinner, but we are doing um, in a couple days in December. You have to check our website for the right dates. I'm forgetting what they are. But we're doing candlelit tours, so you'll be able to see it decorated for 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 Christmas by candlelight without having to compete with the 500 ch children and families on, on Christmas at Canterbury nights. We have a tour and then the dinner. Yeah, okay. so no dinner, but we're doing a tour this is no. Christmas. Yeah, in the back Was again. maple syrup a big industry? Uh, you know, it's it popular was. here. So <laughs> it's a little bit hard for us to talk about, and we don't talk about it that much because um, the Shakers had a lot of maple trees. Um, over a thousand, well over a thousand maple trees that they sort of cultivated as, a, as their, in their sugar bush. And um, that was off, and they had a sugar house for manufacturing, for boiling down the sap. And that was off on land that is now part of um, Shaker State Forts, off of 106. So that's land that actually got sold off. So the foundation of the sugar house is still out in the woods back there. And you can go and explore. But since it's not on our property and it's about a mile and a half, two mile hike from where we are, we don't really talk about it much. But um, in the 19th century, most of the sugar that the community used would have been maple sugar that they generated themselves. They actually have some entertaining discussions in the 1880s about how much maple sugar should they be allocating for the family each week and how much bought sugar should they supplement with and is too, are they using too much sugar essentially. So I think they're slowly adjusting to get more of a sweet tooth. Any other questions? Okay. Who takes care of the land? Yeah. So luckily most of our land is under conservation easement and it's been let to go natural so we don't have to, we have, we have a um, forestry management plan so we work with the state to develop a plan for sustainable harvesting occasionally and things like that. So you don't have to be fields anymore. But we do have some fields and we have a partnership with Brookford Farm in Canterbury so they pasture, if you've driven by the village and seen the adorable cows out in our pastures, um, they pasture their cows at the village and maintain deal with our haying and things like that, so we don't have to. Can you talk a little bit about the baked beans in the oven? That was a big industry that these people might remember even. Yeah, so I sort of, my, my, my program sort of tailed off a little in the 20th century, really in the 20s and 30s when Canterbury sort of stops functioning as a whole community of brothers and sisters. But into the 50s, the sisters they are always thinking about new ways to bring some income in the community. So they have a very um, amazing four-door revolving oven with these sort of large circular shelves that can be rotated that you can fit up to, um, I think it's 60 pies, 20 loaves of bread, or some a number of crocks of beans. So this just take this idea, this sort of image of the Canterbury Shakers as these owners of the, of the revolving oven, and they design sort of a, a fake one to go on the back of, a, of one of their trucks. <laughs> and then they go peddle their baked beans on the streets of Concord. And it's a very profitable industry in the 1950s that, it was, that you could buy um, baked beans and brown bread from the Canterbury Sisters on the streets of Concord. So. I remember seeing that. Anybody here ever buy any? Sisters <laughs> When did they stop accepting people into the... So the last girl at Canterbury who actually signed the covenant, the sort of agreement to become a shaker, Signed it in 1926. The last child taken in by the community came in 1929. Any other questions? I did bring some fun um, props, things that the Shakers manufactured, most of which are reproductions. So you're welcome to wander back there and look at them, and I'll come tell you what they are if you have questions. But you can, the ladies can try on a reproduction Dorothy cloak and see if you're <laughs> willing to shell out the $750 for a Shaker made one, I guess. So I hope you've all had a good time tonight. Tonight, I hope you learned a little bit.